Um, you've heard the introduction, so my name is Jason, and I run a, a digital creative company in London called The Swarm. People say, what's a digital creative company? And I say, it's a company that lets me do whatever I want, because I started it. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not actually joking when I say that. It's, um, we work across all sorts of platforms, media types, and technologies. Um, and that's really integral to what we do. Um, because I always think that you've got to use the right tools to tell the right stories and the right design process attached. So all of our projects are really varied. What I'm going to be talking about tonight is um, something that we're becoming very interested in, which is called the Internet of Things. Um, before I had this company, I was um, working at the BBC until I got uh, the axe, running the mobile department. And um, so I got involved in a lot of this type of mobile media. And that's really cool. Um, and we still do, you know, apps and games and all sorts of stuff like that. But um, I've started thinking about, and there's a lot of work kind of going on behind the scenes that I think a lot of us aren't all that aware of, about other types of mobile media and other types of mobile devices that are starting to kind of crop up around us, a bit like the um, tribbles in Star Wars, if, uh, in Star Trek, if uh, you remember that. And I think we're about to see a real change in the way that media works, and I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit tonight and make some forecasts about how that might make changes to some of the everyday types of think types of media experiences that we have, like you know, how it's going to change a weather report, how it's going to change a cooking show, and some of that type of stuff. So as I take you through this, I'm not saying it's all happening right this minute, but I do think it will come down the road. It may seem futuristic, but bear with me, because at the end, we'll kind of come back to what some of the practical applications of this stuff might start to look like. And um, if I lose you at any point, just Stick your hands up and ask questions. Um, I don't mind if you interrupt me, um, just as long as you're not throwing food. So, um, if I said, uh, if I asked you guys if you wanted to go out and play a uh, mobile video game with me, who would want to wear a device that looks like this, like a, a belt with a sort of giant phone straps to them? Anyone? So then why, when we go out to play outside and play a mobile game, do we expect people to do this? It's completely unnatural, right? It's, it's almost as unnatural as that. So <clears throat> what I'm starting to think about is what are the, uh, these other sort of mobile devices around us? And I think just to sort of put it in context, these are um, prototype hoodies, but they're called neighbor hoodies. And what they've done, the people who invented these, this, this isn't something that we've done, but I think it's brilliant, um, is they've stitched mobile uh, telephony technology into the hoodies, and then put, I don't know if you can see little circles near the ears, they've put speakers inside the hood. So what happens is when you put the hoodie on, you go into the game, and it takes you into a game of tag with the other people nearby who are also wearing the hoodies because it uses the location and the sound equipment to guide you through trying to find people. So it becomes a complete digital game of tag, but you're actually immersed in the game. And the device that you're interacting with is something that's completely natural for going out and playing tag and playing chase, rather than walking around with a 500 pound smartphone in front of you while you're trying to chase people and you know, fall over and smash it, especially if you're as clumsy as I am. Um, this is an app that we built um, when we launched a company called TubeTap. And the idea behind it is that in London, <coughs> if, excuse me, if you're more than delayed by more than 15 minutes on the tube and it's their fault, they owe you a refund. Um, the only difficulty is that you have to sit and make a note of what time you were delayed, which line you were on, what stations you were in between, da 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 da. da. Then remember to go home, write them a letter, spend money on a stamp to post the request to them, and then maybe you get something back. But what we did is we took all of the data out of um, TFL's uh, API, which is their, you know, their big data set about all the journey times, and we created a very simple interface for timing your journeys, and it automatically compares them to how long it should have taken when you basically check in and check out of the stations. And then if you've been delayed unnecessarily, it lets you know and it just shoots off an email request right away and a check comes in the post a few days later, a few weeks later, depending on how backlogged they are. So it seems like a really good idea, hopefully. Um, but I think this is still, again, the wrong place. Because I think that that software should be on the Oyster card system. It's very unnatural. It's a very unnatural interaction when you're rushing for a train to have your ticket in one hand 
put that do thing and then, oh, I have to do this too. Um, why isn't it just integrated? And we know for a fact that the Oyster code system could run that software, but they won't take it from us. We offered to give it to them for free, um, and they won't. They've got 34 million pound slush fund of refunds that they don't give people every year. So um, that might have something to do with it. So all of this technology that I'm talking about, Internet of Things is one of the words for it, but I think a word that, you know, Internet of Things doesn't actually mean very much because everything is a thing. Um, so another word that the analysts have been using that I think is quite useful, um, although I don't think it will catch on, but it's useful in terms of understanding a subphone, which means a wireless device that has mobile te telephony technology in it, but that isn't primarily used for phone calls or text messages. Um, it's not a phone that's on a submarine. Um, who's got one? Submarine. submarine. No, a subphone. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah? Okay. I think the numbers will go up when I show you a few in a minute. Um, and if, you know, just to show you that this is real and that I'm not just imagining it, um, in 2010, uh, the wireless networks in the States ended up having, uh, reaching a point where there were more things connecting to them, and the things were subscribing at a faster rate than people. And to give you some newer numbers, this is, I mean, these numbers are a little bit older from 2011, but it still makes the point that um, we're reaching a point where there's more of these connected devices around than we think, and it's certainly more than people. So we're now at a point where there's about two point something per person globally, which means that in the, you know, in the West and in Europe, um, it's higher than that. And depending on whose numbers you look at, it's different. And the, a lot of these are silent objects that you don't even realize you're interacting with. They're things that are counting um, when you come in the door of a big public building like this and making records of that and putting that information into some sort of internet system for someone. It's um, devices that are telling cities where the buses are. It's devices that are to look, checking that the water pressure is constantly okay in the um, public plumbing systems. So a lot of these connected devices are very, very simple and are just giving out very little basic traces of data, which might seem useless at first, just saying, the bus is here, the bus is here, the bus is here. But when you look at that across a whole city and you look at the speed of those points, it actually starts to become really, really interesting and you can start to do stuff with it. So the fact that one train is delayed isn't that interesting, but when we were able to take all of that data about all of the train delays and start giving people, the giving public access to it, then it starts to turn into a sort of interesting system, an interesting application. Um, this is one um, visualization. I'm sorry that the resolution is not that great, but um, hopefully this is Japan. And after the earthquake and nuclear disaster that they had, I think that was two years ago now, um, people were given Geiger counters to see if the radiation levels in their homes were safe. And what they did from there was um, they were wirelessly connecting onto the, or they were connecting onto the wireless networks of those people's homes. So suddenly you could visualize where there were unsafe levels of radiation all over because those Geiger counters were silently saying you know, what the radiation readings were at all times. And so if you imagine if you could cross this data set with the data set, with, with the navigation system in your car, you'd actually be able to create a safety application that wouldn't take you to any place where there was unsafe data. So, you know, I'm just trying to show you how this wireless technology, when it starts to become embedded in more and more of the things around us, that is the things that are the internet of things, um, it can start to create some really interesting experiences. Um, so, uh, like I said, who thinks they've got some of these? I have one over here, two. Okay, I'm going to show you some that might not seem as surprising as you think. Who's got one of those? Someone's got to have an iPod Touch and a Kindle in this room where we have a very unrepresentative room. Other e-readers? Okay. What about... Anyone have these? Nike Plus or IDS Me? These are um, hardware that you integrate with your um, exercise wear, and it collects data from your body, and it can adjust the entertainment experience that you're having and put data into your computer, which it then publishes to a website. Um, maybe not completely connected in real time, but it's still connecting, taking feedback from your body, and feeding that into an entertainment experience, feeding that into an information experience online. Um, 
And connected cars are something that's coming up. This is a ridiculous illustration, but it's just to make the point that these are futuristic cars. Um, I actually saw a video which I tried to incorporate, but I couldn't. BMW is doing a lot around what they call the connected drive. And that's all about, um, particularly for city drivers who can't, you know, you, you can make the cars go faster and faster, but you can't drive them any better. So they're trying to say, what can we do to enhance the drive? Well, we can connect it so you can constantly and safely get different parts of data and entertainment mediated through your driving experience. And they're showing all sorts of stuff where data gets projected onto the windshield and you can interact with it. There's stuff going on on consoles in the car. Um, I don't know how you're going to drive without being distracted, but that's not my uh, thing to deal with. But also, um, really, really interesting is the CEO of Audi Renault gave the, sorry, I might get this backwards now, two big car CEOs. One of them gave the keynote speech at the Le Web conference last year, which is the big French technology conference um, and one of the most influential conferences, talking all about connected cars and how the car is going to be the next frontier for um, connected entertainment, connected content. And the other one um, was that the, the chairman of one of the other big uh, car manufacturers was saying that he believes that that is their main strategic priority and the next frontier for really improving the driving experience is about connecting it to the internet, connecting it to data, connecting it to content. Um, and there, there's loads of people playing in this space and um, this is a project that um, I've been involved with for the last couple of years. It's called Sunday Drive. It's actually based in America, um, associated with my accent. And um, what it does is it helps recreational drivers find scenic ways of driving places so they can report a scenic route into the app and then get that back. Now, the long-term goal for this, though, is not to have people driving and doing this. Like I said, that's really unnatural. So what we're trying to do is work with the telematic systems to get this built into people's cars so that if they're out for a leisure drive, if they're out for a um, weekend drive where there's traffic and they go, so just get me off the motorway, I'll take the long way if it's scenic, we can help them do that. This is, uh, I'm going to show you a short video, um, which is just to, again, give you an idea of where some of this data comes from, where some of the stories that you can play with are, and what some of the services that are starting to emerge are. It is um, an IBM promotional video. Um, they have a bigger budget for making cool videos than I do, so um, I hope you don't mind. I'm not, I'm not doing an advert for them. <clears throat> and I, I, we won't watch the whole thing. Oh, that's... The first duty of a government is to protect its citizens. The smarter city is like every city on the planet. It has crime, fires break out, natural disasters occur. It even has the occasional fender bender. And, like every other city on the planet, the resources to address these incidents are limited. The problem was everywhere because the data was everywhere. Valuable this is part of the image I really wanted you to see, is that a lot of the stories that are out there, a lot of the content that's out there is in silos of technology, and we need to start thinking about how to make connections between them. Why not just put more officers on more ships, or buy a bunch of new ambulances and fire trucks? Again, like every city on the planet, a smarter city can't spend its way to a safer city. But can it do? Welcome to the Smarter City Integrated Incident Response Center. Like the multi-agency command hubs in New York City, Chicago, and Madrid, the Response Center helps the smarter city's first responders coordinate their efforts to keep the city safer. The 911 call comes in. The system can simultaneously alert police, the ambulance service. Okay. Anyone else scared yeah. about that, like, master control system that's <clears throat> coming out of this? There's a huge level of um, privacy concerns and issues as we move into this space that need to be addressed. And I'm no expert in that, but. Um, it is one point that I always make, is that like as exciting as all this stuff sounds, we really need to think about how can we use this data responsibly and how can we get people creating um, responsible interactions, like your point about the cars, how much trust can you put in the software that it won't crash into something and that the two yeah. cars will communicate, how, you know, at what point does the responsibility, and also when you're constantly giving away your location and potentially what you're doing, um, it becomes really questionable as well, and there's a big product that's about to come to market, um, which I'll talk about in a few minutes um, as well, that's uh, worth thinking twice about. <clears throat> 
So um, just to kind of sum up the part that I've been talking about so far, um, every incident that's going on whenever you interact with one of these devices, with a digital device, is creating some sort of data. And that data can be collected and analyzed and compared over time. And when you start to analyze what's there, that's when you start to get stuff of value out of it. That's when you start to get patterns and insights emerging from the data that you can do stuff with, that you can create a mobile app from, that you can create a car app from, that you can um, make a news report out of. You know, I mean, this, this, this is content and it's living and breathing, you know, right now, current stuff. So um, there's loads of potential in there if we learn how to get our hands on it and do stuff with it. Um, so uh, I'm hoping you guys recognize these things from Dr. Seuss. So they're representing the things on the Internet of Things that I was talking about. This is representing us and this is representing the whole world. Um, and kind of the way the Internet is going right now is that we've got everyone interacting with each other. All the people are on Facebook and email and Instant Messenger and blogs and everything else. And then we've got the buses and the police information, you know, all that stuff in the connected city talking to each other. We've got you know, cars talking to each other. But there's not much conversation going on between the two. And so I think that's where the next you know, big shift in how all of this stuff works is going to come, is when we start connecting the people and the things in this kind of global conversation that's going on. And um, you know, the, the types of things that will be at the center of that, I think, are when we start to have all the different objects around us connected. So when our shoes um, start to be able to get navigation data as we walk around the city, or when our car can change our entertainment experience based on how much traffic we're in, and how you know, these systems all start to link up and you know, completely change how we interact and intermediate the world around us. Um, I'm going to give you some views into the slightly deeper future. I've been showing this um, for a couple of years. I don't know if you can see, um, but this guy's got his glasses on and he's got data being projected onto them, which is then changing what he sees in his field of vision. Um, I've been showing this for about five years. This is from a company called Microvision that have been working very hard on this. Um, has anyone heard of another product that's like this? Google Glass. Google Glass. Can anyone see what's different about this and Google Glass? That one covers more of the eye. The Google Glass is just a little bit in the corner, whereas that's full yeah. vision. What else? You're else. very, very close to what I'm trying to get. Google Glass has a little camera on it. Oh. Everything that you look at is going to potentially be recorded and fed into the Googleplex along with your location. Those don't. That's why I'm saying we need to think about um, what we are surrendering in terms of privacy and how we, you know, make these experiences responsible in terms of privacy and, you know, um, and just simply what's happening with the data that we're getting. You know, if, if we're all walking around with cameras on our faces, Google's getting Street View updated an awful lot more frequently, which means they're going to make more money and have a better product. And what do you get out of it? Um, but to you know, show you how these types of things can work, um, this is another uh, slide from Microvision, or an image from Microvision, uh, where they created a military application that the guys would wear goggles when they were trying to fix an engine. And the instructions would be put into their field of vision, superimposed right onto the engine that they were working on. So it's using augmented reality in a really um, advanced sort of way. So do people know what augmented reality is? I usually put a slide in that explains it first. If you what it is, who doesn't? It's okay if you don't. Okay, so what augmented reality is, is a technology that um, has started on phone handsets, and it allows you to look through the camera at something. So like I might be able to look at that, and it would tell me that that's a speaker or a table or whatever. And you can then use that navigationally to find out where cache points are or directions to get someplace. It can also put fake things into your field of vision. So I could create an application that when I look at you guys, I see a dragon flying over or something like that. But this is a much more practical use. But again, if you're out in the field and you're in the military and you're trying to fix an engine, your hands are going to be busy. You can't do it with one hand and the other one with a phone in your field of vision. So, Again, it's looking for these natural interactions. It's looking for how can we make the data experience, the, the 
experience of this content as natural as possible by having the, tech, the embedded technology in all the stuff around us. I don't want to scare people too much when I talk about the privacy stuff because there is great stuff that can happen, but uh, we just have to really think it through and be very careful. And um, yes, this is real. University of Washington in the States is making contact lenses that will do this. So potentially, we could all wake up and put contact lenses in and have data in our field of vision all the time. So I could look at you and uh, see your Facebook profile, find out everything that you've ever put on there, and as I'm having that conversation, um, know all about you. There's a great uh, video that you may have seen on YouTube um, called How Guys Will Use Google Glass. And um, the guy's out on a date with the girl, and he's like looking at her Facebook pictures and looking at her, girl her girlfriends and uh, pretending that he's interested. And whenever she mentions something really classy that he doesn't know about, he like Googles it really quickly and then gives her some interesting snippet. And he's, uh, you know, then she like bends over to get something on. And, takes a picture down her shirt, um, and then um, at the end she gets up and she says, you know, sorry, I don't think this is going to work. I don't like guys that wear Google Glass. And he said, how do you know I'm wearing Google Glass? And she turns around and she goes, Siri told me, and she's got the, her iPhone on the back of her head <laughs> listening to everything that Siri's telling her about this guy. So it's kind of ridiculous, but it makes the point that, you know, we are coming to a point where we can potentially just have this overwhelming amount of data um, that we're going to have to kind of sift through and mediate through and that makes for really interesting questions about interface when we start to get designs like this where the content and the data becomes pervasive. We're not going to be in a place, I mean I used to, when I would talk about mobile, I would say look we're moving into this world of casual computing, we're not going to go off to the study anymore um, at the end of the evening to check our email, we're going to just reach in our pockets and check our email all the time. And that's what I thought casual computing was going to be, was when you could just you know, have your email with you all the time. But it's not going to be that long, I don't think, before you might get a little blinking red light up in your field of vision that lets you know that you've got mail. So, um, yeah. And um, just to really push it home, um, this is a home robot which is available now. It will play games with you and stuff if you have 15,000 pounds to spare. I've been trying to get them to send me one to try out since I've been talking about it so much they keep saying no. Um, but again, this is a thing that is going to be connected to data and interacting with you all the time if you go for a home robot at some point. Further down the road, obviously. So, um, thinking about you know what happens um, when we create content, because that's what my company does. We're, we're all, we work with technology, we work with design, but ultimately we create content experiences, and that's where my background is. And people were talking about cross-platform content for a long time, and that meant um, how do you reversion stuff across um, TV, web, mobile, and it was kind of just like to make it smaller, so that wasn't quite as exciting, but I think the place where the competition is going to start to come is in this sort of ambient media, and it might not necessarily be data in your field of vision, but can you get part of someone's attention while they're in the car, because that's the most valuable time to be providing them with the content that you're looking for. Can you be uh, providing them with content when they're in the gym because you create fitness information and that's the best time to do it and because you can then personalize the content to the feedback that they're getting from the sensor in their shoes. And um, this is a diagram that um, lots of people use to talk about how people deal with <coughs> information and content and um, you've got data down here which is all the information that's out there. And then um, we used to rely on the media content makers, designers, to sift through that to find the important information and turn that into some form of knowledge for us to consume, which then we would internalize, hopefully, and, that, and whatever we internalized would go away as wisdom. And I think the role of the creator is now shifting down here, and I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily, it's just a change in the way that um, people like myself have to work. We have to think a lot more about data. We have to be looking for data a lot more, looking for those patterns and insights that I was talking about. Because the way things are going is that audiences and technology are interacting with that data to create their own wisdom now. So, you know, through social media, through all of these connected devices, through this silent conversation that I've been talking about, that's how we absorb stuff now. We don't sit and wait for the, the 10 o'clock news to come on. 
um, and go, hmm, very interesting, thank you. We go out, we search, we sift, we look at what our friends are looking at, we um, see what people are sharing across their devices, and, that, and that's how we get this type of experience. Um, so, um, the way that we try to think about these things is by thinking about um, what I call story, story systems that create value for the users. We try to think about, um, or what we need to think about, is how um, can we create content and context that creates meaning regardless of what device it's on. So, um, you know, when we start to have six, seven of these connected things per person, um, you're never going to be able to guess um, that this guy is going to consume the video that I made in this way. He might, you know, not see it on TV. He might see it on Google Glass in his field of vision while he's driving a car and listening to music that's controlled by his shoes. We, we, you know, we just don't know. So we have to start thinking about it in a very different way. The media, um, going back to what you were saying at the beginning about the BBC, um, who I do still love, but um, you know, it's very patriarchal, uh, patriarchal model of like I will tell you what's important and how to consume it, and that's changing, and that's to me, very, very exciting and part of this connected world that's coming. Um, to give you some examples of how this can manifest in ways that um, are simpler and more near term than you think, and show you, I want to show you some, some examples and some tools um, and sources that are out there. This is probably my favorite one, Terrible for Fashion. Um, and my business partner, who's extremely fashionable, um, cringes when I show this. But it, um, does anyone remember the store CNA? used to be in the UK. There's a lot of young people here, so you might not remember. It was like a Henny Pay, an H&M type of store. Um, they're, they're now um, the biggest retailer in South America. They've left Europe, gone to South America. Um, but what they, they've done, which I think is really cool, is they've created these connected hangers that are connecting to the Wi-Fi department, uh, the Wi-Fi in the stores, in the department store. And um, if you could read Portuguese, you would already know what this says. It's number of likes. And this number that's on each piece of clothing shows how many people have liked it on the website. So they're taking that social data right out there, distributing it over Wi-Fi directly onto their collection of clothes. Now, I don't personally want to, that, to know that everybody else had this, but it's an interesting piece of information. Um, and it's just showing how you can have these very, very light touch interactions. You know, we don't have to um, go and like, you know, scan that leather jacket. Who wants to scan a leather jacket, right? Um, but if you just see, ah, there's a piece of information that tells me more about this, that relates it to the social situation that's going on, um, that's quite interesting. And that, you know, just to show here, again, you know, there's data, and then it gets sort of aggregated and, and, and processed through the software and the people using Facebook, and then whether or not you think it's wisdom, but it comes out the other end. But it's the software and the people that are creating it, and the data is the actual content source. Uh, if you're interested in this, and I, I know there's some computing people in the room, um, I'd suggest you have a look at this website, COSM. Um, this is a messed up version of their homepage because this is their old homepage with their new logo on it, um, which they probably wouldn't like me doing. But their new homepage doesn't show all of these different data points. And what this is, is a repository for anyone who has connected devices to contribute data to. And you can see down here, it's a little bit geeky right now because who has connected devices? Geeky people, generally. Um, but you can see they're collecting data on radiation, temperature, electricity, air quality, humidity, light, weather, carbon dioxide, Japan, water. This was around the time of the um, Japanese radiation disaster that I took this screenshot. So, But um, there's all sorts of stuff out there. There's museums publishing how many people are coming through the door. There's um, all sorts of stuff. There's you know moods that people are. Um, transmitting periodically. You, know, you can pick all of this stuff up and, and it's mostly free because people want to share it. They want to be part of that world. Um, I talk to museums a lot. Sorry, let me check the time. I talk to museums a lot and one of the things that I'm saying is like, you know, if you are doing an exhibition on air quality, you, of course you're going to show the historic data. Why wouldn't you pick up the live data and show that to the visitors as well? And then why wouldn't you show them how to make one of these things uh, or sell them one in your gift shop where they can then contribute the data back in and become part of the experiment, bring the museum experience to life using this type of data. 
Um, this is another platform um, developed in the UK as well, which is really cool, um, called Tales of Things. And this is a platform that lets people connect memories to objects, real world objects. And the thing that's um, worth saying about this that's really interesting is it's um, almost technology free because the only technology that gets attached to the object is a QR code that you print out on your printer. So you're not actually like embedding and mobile engineering technology into the devices, but what you're doing is you're making them addressable on the internet via the QR code, because the QR code turns into a URL, which then means that the thing is addressable by the internet and by people on the internet. And so to show you, because uh, you're, you're probably like, why would you want to attach memories to things? I'm going to show you another video. I think this is a really, really cool application of this. It takes a minute to get going. But anyway, what they did was um, Oxfam had this big um, charity store kind of sale in Selfridges. So you can imagine the type of charity club, charity shop clothes that Selfridges has. Um, but the clothes then had these QR codes attached to them, and they were going through the Tales of Things platform. So each piece of clothing was a piece of clothing, but it also had memories attached to it. And when you got the clothes, you could then scan the thing and find out what memories were attached to your piece of clothing. And we'll see an example in here. Sorry, PowerPoint won't let me forward it, so I have to listen to some music for a minute. So this lady's got this nice yellow dress. And lo and behold, it used to be Annie Lennox's, and she wore it to Nelson Mandela's birthday party. So, and that will stick with that garment as long as the tag stays with it. And now she might be able to attach a memory and say, ah, here's the video of me wearing it at my daughter's wedding, or you know, whatever it is. And so, not every single piece of information is going to be hugely meaningful, but things can start to uh, collect these sort of tales of data and tales of content alongside them, which then can be analyzed and processed. Like I was saying, all of this data creates some sort, you know, creates enough, every interaction creates more data, and you can do stuff with that data over periods of time. I think this is going to be a really slow game before we see all of this value unlocked, because things need to start collecting the data before we can start doing it. Um, and again, like when I talk to the museum world, that's what I'm saying to them. You have the most interesting things in the world, why aren't they in the Internet of Things? Because the Internet of Things right now is lots of boring stuff like motion sensors. Um, so, again, I, I promise to, at, towards the end of this, bring it home um, a little bit and try and show you how it might change some of the um, world around us, uh, it's change some of the kind of content that we're used to dealing with all the time rather than whiz bang applications and cars. Um, so, first one, weather report. Anyone recognize Hurricane Sandy? This is a little bit of an understatement that I use these graphics. But um, we're at home. Oh, and sorry, that's the other thing I wanted to say. It's just, you know, I sort of put it into this framework of connected environment, connected home, connected devices, and connected body, um, or what's being called WBAN instead of WLAN, so it's wide, uh, wireless body area network or cyborgism, which is kind of the idea of that has been around in science fiction for a long time, where man and machine merge, um, and you know, potentially, depending on how you look at it, the idea that we could have contact lenses that are com continuously computing for us, maybe that's where cyborgism begins. So I've kind of tried to categorize these a little bit there. So um, connected environment, I think that could change how we consume weather reports. Um, right now, if uh, you wanted to find out if Hurricane Sandy was going to come and total the place that you grew up, um, you would have to go to the news um, and you know sit down and watch whatever. Um, but what could happen when there's a storm coming if you you know do a little bit of hacking, and this is possible right now, is you could take the weather conditions for a specific location and put a small um, Wi-Fi chip and uh, audio, uh, you know, a, bit, a bleeper, why can't, why can't I think of the word? Anyway, you could, a little sound device into an umbrella 
And that umbrella by your door could beep at you whenever it's going to be rainy in the location where you live. Um, and just as a reminder, you know, six hours from now it's going to be pouring raining here. Beep, 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 beep. So the content actually starts to come to you rather than you having to go down and sit and wait for the, the weather to come on or looking online. Um, and, you know, you're too busy in the morning to go and, like, do that at the computer if you're anything like me. So, um, yeah, that's that point. Another one, who remembers this movie? Who was scared? Who was really scared? Who was really, really, really scared? Uh, sorry, which one is it? There was quite a few of them, reality. This, oh, sorry, this was from the, the, sorry, this was from the poster of, um, it, it kind of doesn't matter, but it's from the poster of the Blair Witch Project. Um, and what we're doing is we're getting into a world where um, facial recognition starts to become possible, um, and brain uh, reading starts to become possible. There's a couple of game systems out there that actually read your mind waves, and there's no joystick anymore. You just think what you want to happen on the screen, and it starts happening. Um, there is question? Like, actually, I think last year there was a technology science conference in, in, in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. They actually had a little short movie where you watch a movie, put the finger in your head, watch a movie, and the snake comes. If you're too scared, some of the flowers start to bloom and stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of exactly the idea here, is that, uh, you know, if um, it starts getting biofeedback from you that you're sweating a lot, um, and that you're thinking that you're scared to death, it can actually tone down the scariness, it can change the narrative of the film. Um, or, if you're like sitting there cool as a cucumber, um, tapping your feet and kind of like, you know, relaxed, it can start making it scarier. And uh, there's a system called Mind Play. I don't know if that's the one that you saw that does that. And there's another one called Emotive, E-M-O-T-I-V. Actually, they're both spelled weird. Mind Play is Mind Play with a Y instead of an I, and Emotive has no E at the end. Um, and, you know, there's more and more of this stuff starting to come down the road. I mean, I've tried these systems, and they, you know, it's a little bit weird. They do work. One of them um, has to do a brain scan quickly where they kind of calibrate it to your own systems, and the woman who invented it looked at my brain scan and said, that's very, very strange. They never look like that. So that might tell you something. <laughs> um, next one um, is thinking about um, what if you could have a documentary that could sense how long you wanted to watch it for? And what topics you were interested in and wanted to find out about in depth. So this is using the same type of technology. Am I just in the mood for a quick dose of planet Earth? Um, or do I want like the full extended DVD thing? And then when it gets to my favorite fish, um, how to do like a sort of deep dive, no pun intended, until I get completely bored of looking at my favorite fish and then it comes back into the main narrative and picks up again. Using this type of stuff, that can happen. Hard on the TV people, though. Um, facial recognition is another one that's coming out, sorry, um, that's out there where um, you can start to gauge people's reaction based on what their face looks like um, and based on what expressions they're making. I think that's going to be particularly interesting in the art world, looking at whether or not you can capture people's reactions to different artworks and what that might mean and what you might be able to gather about them. Um, good old Nigella, um, she's always cooking up something delicious. Um, but what if um, we had little tiny um, sensors that were around our body that were saying, actually, you've been on the salt too much today, or, you know, you said you're supposed to be cutting back on sugar, and we know. And, you know, that type of thing, they're starting to be able to detect that. They're even starting to look at little robots that you could potentially put into you. That's not going to happen anytime too soon. But, that, you know, all of that data is going to be translating. So when you get the recipes from Nigella, perhaps they could be adjusted for you to be nutritionally right for you. So this isn't just personalizing it going, oh, well, I put strawberries instead of bananas on it. This is actually like being able to integrate right with data that's being drawn out of you. Um, and then another one, if you have uh, the glasses or Google Glass or whatever, um, perhaps you're having that lovely, you know, sit down and watch some TV, watch your favorite show with your other half, on, posing on the couch. Um, but then you have an opportunity to pause the main story and go off and see your own side stories, subplots, based on your favorite characters, get a branched narrative of the experience, and then come back to watching the main show you were watching. Both having watched the same show, but having had slightly different experiences because you have this ability to have a personal, private display um, while you're watching. 
Yep. So that we're, um, we're so we've got a bid in at the moment for our electric seven projects, working with a, uh, quite a few people throughout Europe, and uh, we're looking for some. This is this okay. looking for personalised TV yep. and interaction with groups uh, where, the, where the TV program is personalised to the end user. So objects. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, we should talk afterwards because we 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 just built um, something that uh, sort of does that. It provides the branching. Okay. Video. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can say the, the other thing is that uh, before we start um, giving you fancy um, recipes from Nigeria and everything, the first thing we're going to use it for is a uh, personal, uh, personalized uh, product placement. So it's seven things. <laughs> Gotta have a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's about it. Thank you.